a warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today for this second session of our virtual academic program on aligning resources with national security strategies in Africa. Uh, for those who did not attend the first session, my name is Luca Paul, and I am the academic dean at the Africa Center and the faculty lead of this program together with my colleague, Victor Duell. And I will be moderating this uh, session as well. Uh, before we start our second session, uh, let me share with you some of the key takeaway from session one. And the session one uh, 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 about the, uh, uh, the uh, public expenditure review. And the uh, one of the, uh, one of the things that came out is to understand the set the status of security spending in Africa. And I think you may agree with me that uh, little Gary and little Willine did a great job in really stating a problem of the security sector, what, what is happening in the security sector in Africa. Although there are very clear variation in the military or security spending in Africa, I think generally the military spending in Africa has been increasing and will continue to increase as shown by the poll results of you. However, there are some countries that have shown a decline in their military and security spending. Beside this persistent increase in security spending in Africa, as citizens continue to feel that the level of national security and personal safety and their personal safety have not been improving at all, but instead it deteriorated in the state, uh, according to Ibrahim Index of African Governance. And this much between high security spending and its outcome in terms of national security and personal safety raise fundamental questions of the rationale for such spending, the value for money of such spending, and its opportunity costs in terms of other public services such as education, health livelihood, food security, and infrastructure. And then the, the real question is, is the current level of security spending in Africa justifiable? There is no commonly agreed level of security and military spending, as each country has its own unique security challenges and threats. However, all member states of African Union, all your countries, all our countries, have agreed to report their military spending to the United Nations with a commitment to be transparent with their security and military spending, not only to their citizens, but also to other member states, particularly the neighboring states, as effective way of building trust and allaying fears. In 2021, this year, only one African country has submitted its military expenditure report to the United Nations. In 2020, there were no submission from African countries about their military spending. Whatever the level of spending, the real question is whether such spending is justifiable in terms of security threats and challenges facing these countries. Some participants justify, justify such spending because of the survival threats of the states in Africa. And however, the evidence shows that the security threats facing Africa today are more internal, including governance deficit and not external. And this raises another question of how African countries identify and prioritize their security threats and challenges. Other consideration to justify the security spending is the added value and the opportunity cost, the choice between bread and gun of such spending within the security development governance nexus. That is well articulated by Kofi Annan that humanity cannot enjoy development without security or security without development or both without respect for human rights. For example, it is estimated that 50% and 5% of the global military spending will contribute to achieving sustainable development goals number three of health security and sustainable development goal two of agriculture and food security respectively by 2030. Other consideration to justify the security spending is whether such spending is guided by national policies and strategies. While most African countries do have such strategy, whether it is written or not, such policies are kept secret 
and designed and implemented without the engagement of the, particip of the participation of the citizens. And that contribute to the growing lack of trust of citizens in the security institutions and agencies. And I think the fundamental question from the session one is about whose security at this? Is it the state security or citizen security? I think during preliminary discussion and discussion group, most participants argue that, argue for more military spending because of the security threats such as violent extremism, terrorism, that's, the, that's threatened the survival of state. There is a dominant state-centric approach in the way security is received, planned, managed, and delivered to citizens in Africa. But even these new threats, who is at risk? In fact, that they stay, is it a state or citizen? Citizens are the ones at the risk of such new threats more than the state, and the focus should be citizen security rather than state security. The contemporary security threat facing Africa are unlikely to be addressed with national security approach of more military spending, but rather through foresighted and inclusive and participative policy and strategic aims approach with citizen security as the focus. I say the security spending in Africa is to be guided by citizen security as the main reference and the way security perceive, plan, manage, and deliver must involve the citizen are the primary beneficiary of such a public service. Maybe one of the concepts that I would like to share with you, and I hope you will take it away from session one, is then what is this public expenditure review of security sector? So public expenditure review, as it is abbreviated, is PER, is a tool to inform governments about the decision through the public finance lens about how best to develop an internal security sector to deliver better the service of the citizen. It is about this tool. It is about institutional audit and mapping of security sector by throwing light on the security sector management structure, the key actors and their function, policy, strategies, regulation, and the way in which the political economy of the security sector affects the quantity and the quality of resource allocation and management. It equally addresses the question of whether program of security sector have adequate and sustainable resources, without which they are at best ineffective or at worst likely to create additional sources of conflict and violence. It also addresses the value for money in security spending to justify additional resources from national budgets and development partners to modernize and professionalize security sector to deliver better security to the citizen and the state. It's also pro provide a thorough analysis of security resource allocation, trade off underlying different policy options. In particular, it can help to address the tendency of security sector resourcing to absorb a huge share of its scarce public resources and crowd out other activities required to build to rebuild the nation politically, socially, and economically. Last but not least, it addresses the way that financial management of the security sector reflect, reflects on the legitimacy of government to both domestic and external stakeholders. As the provision of security service is a fundamental public good that the state are expected to provide for the citizen and sustain in accountable manner to their citizens. So this, this some of the key takeaway from session one. So now let me go to the, this session two. Session two is about planning security resources. In fact, the link between national security strategy and budgeting. So before introducing the, uh, the panelists of today, let me share with you the main objective of this session. As the majority of you from the polling results suggest increase in military and security spending, we would like really this session to provide a basis to rationalize how to align security resources with national security strategies in Africa. In particular, we'll discuss allocation and alignment of security resources through national security strategy and budgeting process. And second, to examine the core 
budgeting or budgetary approaches and principles and how they can guide the planning, allocation, and alignment of security resources through national security research. And last, discuss the challenges and lessons learned for effective allocation and alignment of security resources through national security uh, strategy. Um, let me now introduce the year uh, the panelists. I'm happy that we have today uh, three outstanding and seasoned experts on security uh, issues. Addicto Willin, that she, 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 she was a panelist in the session one, and Dr. Feli Shapur, and Dr. Emil Rodrago, who will help us to start our conversation today about how to align security resources with national security strategy in Africa. As you have the bios, I will highlight some few relevant aspects of their expertise and experience. I need not to talk more with Emilene because I introduced her uh, last time, but I think the most important thing is that she's a seasoned uh, public finance expert. And, uh, and, and she served in different capacities, uh, whether at the African Development Bank or at the US Federal Reserve System. And she holds a degree in social studies from Harvard University and African history from St. John's University, as well as PhD in development economics from Columbia University. Willian, most welcome again to joining us in this second session. We are so proud and we're happy having you. Um, the second panelist is Dr. Feli Shepard. She's an adjunct fellow at the Africa Center, and she is an independent expert in conflict and security. And she's the one actually to view the National Security Side Development Toolkit. So we are so grateful for her great work in reviewing the toolkit. Uh, she is a, a rostered expert for the International Security Sector Advisory Team. And she went before with the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, which is abbreviated DCAV. And DCAV is really a world leading uh, center in, in terms of security governance. They have a lot of work. Even for us, we benefit also from the work uh, in why we're developing the, uh, the toolkit. So he, Having her coming from such, a, uh, such an institution is a, big, uh, is, a, is, a, is a big advantage for this program and for, for the African Center. And she holds master uh, from the Geneva Graduate Institute and PhD from Otto Suhal Institute of Political Science in Berlin. So, uh, Dr. Feli, you are most welcome and we are so happy joining us today. Uh, the last but not least, uh, Emil Odrago. He's currently an adjunct professor of practice at the Africa Center. And uh, he has been engaging with Africa Center since 2007. He compiled various case studies on the national security strategy in Africa uh, that provided basis for the development of our toolkit, the national security strategy one toolkit. And he played a significant role even in the drafting of the, of the toolkit. I think one of his highly read publications at the African, Africa Center is the, uh, a paper entitled Advancing Military Professionalism in Africa. I believe it should be one of the, uh, it is available uh, free online and, and from our, our website. Uh, he is the president, he's the president of the Foundation for Citizen Security in Burkina Faso. And he served as a member of the scientific committee that guided the national security development uh, process in Burkina Faso. He served as a minister of security of Burkina Faso and a member of National Assembly of Burkina Faso, as well as a member of the parliament of the Economic Community of West Africa State, ECOWAS Parliament, where he sat as the political affairs, peace, defense, and security committee. He earned his PhD from the Center for Diplomatic and Security Studies in Paris, uh, France. So we're really, really very lucky having uh, Emil. He will provide us with a really practical uh, example and the experience of the national security strategy uh, development and, uh, and linking it to the resource allocation. So let, let, let me start now with, with, uh, with my the conversation first with um, Victor Willing. I think taking into account the fact that most of the participants, they believe there's a need to increase 
the military spending or security spending. And the real discussion today is how can we rationalize whether the allocation of cyber resources. And uh, so given your experience in public finance, can you share with the participant in simple terms and to non-experts in the field, <laughs> the, 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 the budget process and how it is linked to allocation and alignment of security resources. In other words, what is the critical element in the budget cycle that plays an important role in the allocation of resources to various sectors, particularly the security sector. So Dr. William, you're most welcome, please. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Paul. And uh, I am particularly pleased to be here with uh, two absolutely wonderful scholar practitioners who I think will help us understand the, the challenge of aligning the resources with the country objectives. Through this slide, I hope that we will understand two very important aspects of the security sector budgeting process. Um, first, I want to make clear that uh, when Dr. Paul mentioned we will focus on security sector planning, he included in that the process first of having laws to support the budgeting process, the policies, the protocols, especially in the terms of the security sector for handling confidential information, um, the execution of the budget, that is the, uh, the whole process of procurement, and the evaluation and finally going back to uh, planning for the next period. So that when we look at the budget process, there are two aspects that are important. First of all, the budget process itself. How, was, how well does this process mobilize and allocate the resources? And then, in the case of our main topic today, we're also interested in how the security sector budget process is integrated within the national budget process so that there are in a sense, two objectives. Are the resources allocated, allocated between the security sector and the other sectors in ways that are consistent with national security and overall economic growth and well being. And secondly, are the resources allocating according to the priorities that are outlined in the national security strategy? So these processes of allocate, allocation of the resources and integration of the security sector into the whole national budgeting process are guided by 10 principles of public financial management. Although we'll discuss several of the principles later, it's important to recognize two principles that guide the very first stages of the budget process. And if we look at the first stage, of course, it is setting the macro fiscal objectives. And that first stage must be guided by discipline, by financial discipline, so that the revenues are sufficient to cover all expenses. If there is a gap, the method of filling the gap, whether it's borrowing or donor funds, must be sustainable. The principle of discipline guides the macro financial and macro fiscal objectives that are outlined in phase one. Now this initial stage of the budget is also guided by the principle of comprehensiveness. All government activities should be included in the budget. There should be no off-budget 
expenses, but also no off budget revenues. All sectors should be included in the government wide information and management systems, including the government wide treasury system that uh, releases and appropriates funds to the different sectors for their activities. Comprehensiveness applied to the security sector requires that all security institutions be included, not just the military and the police, but also customs, emergency forces, and the justice systems. In many countries, there are also customary or informal authorities that provide security at the local level. And it's very important to assess their performance and allocate them the appropriate funds. Uh, many of us have discussed the security institution known as the Hotla in Botswana, which is a community level uh, method of reconciling disputes. The 10 budget principles that work together it's not one principle there, one there, but they interact, they reinforce each other. Deficiency in one is likely to lead to a problem uh, in another area. But we do have two other overall principles that every single um, manager thinks about, and that's efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, Dr. Paul referred to efficiency when he mentioned value for the money spent. Efficient budget execution would mean that the systems and processes related to procurement, payroll, and other activities are done at a reasonable cost. And effectiveness will re relate back to the performance relative to our target indicators. We want to be sure that the activities and resources that support them are designed and allocated in a way that supports our ultimate goal. And later today, you will receive a copy of an exercise that's based on this graph. What I'd like to ask that each of you do is consider your own country and your own institution and how they move through the budget cycle, who are the important actors at each stage of the process, and what is the key information that you need at each stage, and why are these actors and information important to achieve the budget objectives. So in the discussion group, you'll have a chance to go over each one of these stages. The important point to remember now is that there is an orderly process, there's a time for each stage in the process, and it is absolutely essential that the security sector process fit within the same framework and be guided by the same principles that every other sector of the economy is guided by. Thank you, Shreen. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lin. It's good that you, you brought up the, uh, uh, this issue of discipline and the, uh, and the cycle itself and how the security sector is integrated in the, in the general budgeting process. And I think one of the things people should know as well, and I think um, Dr. Lin will, will, uh, will come Later on, the budget itself, the moment it is appropriated, becoming appropriation act, it is a law and becoming really very compelling for the countries and for the institution. I mean, to to respect uh, this as a law of uh, is a law that needs to be respected, and that is the budget itself. Uh, we know that there are a lot of challenges uh, in terms of how best you can be able to adhere to the provisions of the uh, of the budget. But this has led me to come to the, uh, the second question, uh, Dr. Willian, maybe to highlight one of the things that we promised the participant is really they will go out with some principles. 
and I think you highlighted them, but I think it would be good to sharpen them and then to explain it in a very, in a simple way. So what, what, so what are the, the core budgetary process? Would you, I, I know you are going to highlight these 10, but even possible if you can look at the issue of this people-centered process or budgeting process, this idea of a budget, budget should be a means driven or the uh, or, or objective driven uh, uh, and, and how these are important for effective allocation and the alignment of security resources. Uh, and, and can you share also some of the challenges of the difficulties of applying such budgetary principles, the 10 principles you talk about, or these approaches uh, to the security sector in Africa? Uh, Laura, come please. Thank you very much. And I think there are unique challenges. One of the reasons I want to focus on principles is because there is no cookie cutter solution uh, for the security sector challenges of African countries. Each country is unique. And so it's hard even to talk about best practices because what might be a best practice for Mali might not be a best practice for Burkina Faso, even though they are very near each other and appear to face the same challenges. So each country must develop its own national security strategy and have its own budget with a budget that is guided by these principles. Now we spoke about comprehensiveness and discipline. Um, and comprehensiveness means all operations are in the budget and there's a common pool of resources. Uh, discipline means that we have a hard budget constraint. We don't spend beyond the fiscal envelope. And now the other principles include specification, which means you, you have a specific code for, for each activity and you spend according to the appropriation for that activity. Periodicity basically means that we have a regular schedule for the audits. Uh, it might be annual, but there are benefits. Uh, Dr. Willin, I guess let me ask, Joel, can you put the, uh, the, uh, the slide on the, on the principle? Thank you very much. Yeah. And then we have accuracy. Are my projections honest and unbiased? Are they credible? Also legitimacy. The policymakers can change the policies, but if they can change the policies, they must participate in the original formulation of those policies. So we're now discussing legitimacy. And finally, I'd like to highlight the last three. Um, contestability basically means that every sector and activity competes against the other. One minister doesn't walk into the room and say, well, I know that my ministry is the most important in the country and therefore I get the most resources. The minister will have to present um, the objectives that are available and demonstrate a good use of the resources allotted. And finally, in order to really assess the performance, we must have transparency. That is the roles and responsibilities must be clear. The budget documents need to be accessible. I don't, by accessible, I don't mean that I can go to a computer and, and see the document. I mean that I can actually understand the document. And in many countries have released a, a citizen budget that is available to every citizen. Um, perhaps it might even look like a comic book, but actually it has the important facts that are that uh, the citizen needs to assess the budget. And finally, accountability means that 
the expenditures must be voted for, authorized by competent authorities before the execution of the budget. Now these budgetary principles have been in place for many years and they've been discussed uh, in your book, Securing Development, uh, taken from a paper that Nicole Ball and Malcolm Holmes uh, presented nearly 20 years ago. However, there are some newer ideas related to the budget and you can take that down now think about these new ideas um, which relate to the paper that you, I hope will read by Alif I. Sahin Ipek. And this paper presents some of our new approach, including environmentally sensitive budgeting uh, and gender budgeting. But our focus is going to be on her discussion of participatory budgeting uh, and the related citizens budget. Now, I believe that some of you are coming from countries um, that have developed or in the process of developing a national security strategies. Others have not yet started that process, but participated in the workshop on security strategies early this year. And Dr. Shapui will um, talk more about that actual process. But one of the most, to me, the most significant things about that workshop was that it explored the ways in which citizen participation on strategy formulation helped the planners to first identify the threats, define security, and prioritize the objectives, that is from a citizen's perspective. And that enabled the country to answer the question, whose security, state security or citizen security? We, with those, the participation of citizens, one has a better understanding of what citizen security is. Dr. Epek points out that citizen involvement goes beyond the obvious increase in accountability. Uh, they can actually be involved in implementation and evaluation with citizen satisfaction surveys serving as instruments of monitoring and evaluation of budget expenditures and related activities. In some cases, citizen participation includes that release of the citizen budget that summarizes the most important parts of the budget and provides a record of performance assessed by objective indicators. Uh, done well, citizen participation and strategy and budgeting can improve the effectiveness of government operations. I would like to say though, that even though participation is something that governments may be able to control, uh, that the latest Mo Ibrahim Index of African Governance showed that governance declined in Africa in the year of the most recent study, that is 2019, because of a decline in performance and security of the rule of law and a decline in participation. And so in effect, governments are not availing themselves of this critical tool for governance of their countries. So we would certainly encourage participation, not just in the formulation of the security strategy, but in the formulation and implementation of the budget to align the two in a better way. Oh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, William, for the uh, for such, for providing us these ten ten principles and the cycle. And please, for the uh, participant, that uh, these are available. Uh, these information are available in the book, which is one of our main 
uh, uh, reading material securing development by the World Bank. And it's a good read. It's really you can be able to to see some of the challenges that we, I mean, some of the issues that this principle. And I hope one of the things that I hope by, by the end of this session is whether you can be able to keep some of these principles. And I think she, uh, Dr. Willian also highlighted some of these, these principles. And in terms of allocation and, um, and, and, and the alignment of security resources, uh, so aligning security resources with the national security strategy, this issue of contestability. For you to sell yourself as a sector, you must appeal not only for the uh, in the uh, in the allocation of resources. How can you make a case, not only to the Minister of Finance, but even to the citizen and to the Parliament? And the only, and that's why the issue of contestability is becoming. Up. How can you justify? How can you appeal? How can you convince that when you are competing with other sectors? How can you make a case? And making a case is about the issue of. Uh, the, uh, the, the uh, national security so he will come later on uh, when uh, uh, fairly will be talking about it. Maybe the last the last question uh, uh, the, the last uh, the last question is just the uh, I think we will talk later on also about the challenges. I mean you will highlight more later on these uh, these uh, the uh, the challenges in applying this principle to the security sector in one way or another. Uh, um, maybe the last question is about what are the, some of the key lessons learned for effective, um, what, are, what are some of the key lessons learned and the best practice of budgeted process that would ensure effective planning and the alignment of security resources? So maybe briefly, that would be, uh, and if you can highlight some of the challenges of applying the, uh, the, uh, these principles to the security sector would be great. Um, Dr. William, you're most welcome. Yes, thank you very much. And I will be brief because I think we will learn from um, the experiences of the, the participants. Uh, we did mention last week that we learned some lessons uh, from the experience of the Central African Republic related to having off budget revenues. And we also mentioned um, the challenges that Liberia faced in terms of parliamentary oversight, the fact that the security sector is unique in terms of the level of complexity of some of the assets purchased, some of the weapon systems, and the, the amount of financial management uh, skill that's needed to really assess it. So what we find in many countries and I must admit it's also true in the United States is that parliamentarians, uh, members of Congress require additional training in order to fulfill their role of security sector oversight. But what I'd like to do is turn to one very, very difficult uh, case and just mention briefly the experience of Niger. Uh, that uh, experience is first mentioned in the book security sector, um, securing development by the World Bank. But there was a more recent paper published in July by the World Bank that addressed the issue of performance expenditure review in Niger. And there has also been uh, a brief paper by the United States Institute of Peace just uh, a few months ago about the challenges that Niger is facing. Uh, Niger is what we would call a tough case. It is a country that has clearly outlined its objectives for development and is in the process of outlining its objectives for security, but the challenges are enormous and the resources are limited. And so what we've seen happen there is that a country that had been growing, and in fact, I should mention that um, the former president won the award from the Mo Abraham Foundation because the country was making progress in overcoming poverty, in reducing uh, poverty going from 
48% of the population to 40% below the poverty line. But at the same time, enormous challenges emerged first in terms of the pandemic and then a worsening security uh, situation. And so the government decided to continue its macro financial reforms. The government for the last 10 years has been devoting attention to increasing its ability to budget and um, manage its finances. Yeah. And they came to the very hard decision okay. mm -hmm. that the only way they can get more is to have more value from the existing resources. Okay. Yeah, and so it. the government has started a program of okay. reform to increase the tax revenue, use the revenue it has better okay. so that it can meet its objectives. It's being yeah. very realistic in recognizing that yeah. process. Okay, so thanks Dr. William. I, I know we are having a bit of limited time now and uh, we'll discuss more. For the participant, in case you have some questions, please you can uh, uh, type in your questions and we can follow up. I know our time is getting very limited, but um, as Victor Feli, really, uh, just based on your, your practical experience uh, in the security sector of home on the continent and the, your view of the toolkit, can you share with, with us the rationale for the national security strategy, the brief process of its development and its core elements? I know the time is getting short. If you can uh, handle it within uh, five to six minutes, I, I would appreciate that one. And Dr. Feli, you are welcome, please. Thank you, Dr. Luca. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be with you again today. Um, yeah, national security strategy development essentially has one purpose. It's about deciding what you're going to do and how you're going to do it when it comes to national security. And that has two pieces, two moving parts. There's a policy part and there's a strategy part. When we talk about national security strategy, we mean policy and strategy because deciding how you're going to do something implies that you already know what you're going to do. So you have objectives and then you have your strategy for achieving those objectives. So when we talk about, you will have seen in your resources, there's the NSSD toolkit. Some of you have been part of previous courses on this. Uh, others of you have been involved on the real world side of this policy and strategy development. So when we say NSSD, that's what we're talking about. What we mean by that then the policy part means setting objectives, developing a policy for national security provision. What is it you want to do? What do you aim to achieve? And in a national security strategy or policy, and, and the words are used differently in, in different places, um, this entails a process of firmly establishing a vision for national security provision based on a clear articulation of values and a clear definition of what security means in this national context. As, as Dr. Johnson said, um, every context is unique, and that means that there will be different influences in terms of vision and values and the definition of security. And that all needs to be discussed, clarified, clearly articulated, and written down to feed into these objectives. And this is this is a critical link then to, to public financial management because you can't make a good argument for the use of resources if you don't know what it is that you're aiming to achieve with those resources. So in that way, the policy part of a national security strategy is really important. And this is also um, linked to the idea of developing a policy, going through an inclusive participatory process is again linked to this idea of people-centered security, human security, the idea that it is the responsibility of the state and the mission of the security sector to provide for the security of the nation and its people. So the, the well-being, the security, the safety of the population should be central to this process. So that's the policy part. And then the strategy part is, okay, you know what you want to do. You've clearly set objectives. How are you going to do it? You have um, certain priorities, for example, among your objectives. This is the thing about security. Insecurity is always urgent. It's always existential. It always is perhaps seen as the most important thing. 
But that doesn't mean that you have the ability, the capacity or the resources to respond to every security threat. So you have to prioritize. And a national security strategy becomes a practical document, a planning tool, a budgeting tool, when it gives a framework for setting priorities and making these tough decisions. Um, there are tools in the national security development process for this. So threat assessments, for example, an analysis of risks to which the nation is exposed, and then also conducting a security sector audit, which is just a, a, a big word for a simple process of going through the, just establishing what are existing capabilities in the security sector and are they primed to respond to the, the threats that have been defined and the objectives that are set out in the policy. And this links to what we talked about last week in the public expenditure reviews, because looking at the quality of resource allocation, the quality of national management of resources is a key element of whether or not the security sector is primed to respond well to the threats that it's defined. And so in this process of national security policy and strategy making, it's really important to remember also that a written document is going to be the outcome of a national security strategy making process, but the process itself, that is what really matters to you, to this. And that is um, especially true to the extent that it's inclusive and participatory. And this has two meanings. It means on the one hand, including all aspects of security provision. Don't focus narrowly on defense and the military, focus more broadly on every aspect of internal and national security division. So policing, justice, borders, intelligence, all of the security sector needs to be involved. And that includes all of the executive agencies that are involved in management and oversight. So that means also ministries of finance which are key actors then in the decisions about allocations of resources and how, um, how much is available and how much should be spent, how and when. But it also has a larger meaning in terms of reaching out beyond the executive functions of a government towards parliament, civil society, media, and the public itself in an inclusive, consultative, particip participatory way. Sometimes this is something that's unfamiliar with national security because uh, traditionally it's often thought of something as the exclusive, secret, that's handled among a small circle of very specialized um, high-level officials. And this is a, a slightly old fashioned way of looking at this policy making process and it misses out on something really important, which is inclusive participatory national security strategy is going to come to a more realistic assessment of objectives and threats and capabilities. And it's also going to be more legitimate and more credible in its implementation. It's gonna be a better tool for planning. And, and that's really critical since planning is key to preparedness. Yeah, thanks, thanks fairly. I know the time is very short. We would like you really to talk to talk more about the uh, about this uh, the uh, national security strategy. But this is a big question, and I think we I really recommend you to to look at the toolkit that is available in your reading. Uh, maybe the, Dr. Fairly, if you can just share, it is um, it is um, it is one thing having a strategy. But what are some of the key challenges in uh, and in 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 developing national security strategy, uh, and to becoming an inclusive and transparent, enough inclusive and transparent process, and and how this is very important in the allocation or hindering the reasonable important for the allocation of an alignment of security resources. Uh, please, you're welcome. We'll be sure, in just in five minutes. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I think this is the same slide that you've just seen, and and the point of it is to show you where the NSSD process fits with this larger, this outside circle of national priorities, and then inside that security sector budget planning and national security strategy development is a, the central wheel at the center of all this that is about defining what you're going to do and how you're going to use the resources available for it. So the drafting process for developing a strategy and a policy feeds into an implementation process 
and this feeds back then into review. Um, so a policy is always a cyclical thing. And this is really important then for, for planning and, and an inclusive consultative approach to this type of, of policy making and strategy making is important in ensuring that the real world concerns, the real world challenges are built into what the security sector is trying to, to respond to. Um, and this really matters because um, if resource allocation has to be based on a policy, well, it's this national security strategy making process where the policy is developed. And as I think Dr. Luki said in the introduction, you know, there's always a policy, someone somewhere has decided what to do. But if it's not written down, if it isn't um, clearly articulated and informed by a wide range of views, then it can't respond to these principles of good financial management. And if we just look quickly at the second slide, we can see that, um, uh, thank you, um, we can see that you know, a, a policy that's not written down is not contestable, it's not coherent, it's not transparent, it's not accountable, it's, it's not consistent over time, it's not useful for planning. And it's there's different ways in which all of the parts of the NSSD process link to these principles of, of public financial management. But it is a challenging process. And the, one of the big challenges with this is uh, secrecy and the idea that... Uh, only certain people, only security professionals should be involved in policy strategy making. And when it comes to who controlling the money, this, this challenge is even more acute. So prioritizing and having the technical competencies, but also an inclusive process where reliable information is shared with those who need it is really important. And then also another challenge with this in terms of, of strategy policy making and resource management is we tend to make the mistake of thinking that more money is always going to solve every problem. And that is simply not true. Um, one way to think about it is uh, a security sector that is inefficient or unprofessional in its management of resources can't provide security. The same way a bucket that has a hole in the bottom doesn't matter how much water you put in the top, it's never going to be full. And this is a, this is a similar challenge in security sector resource management and governance. A military or a security sector that can live within its means and function professionally um, within, with a, the, within the budget envelope, according to this principle of discipline that, that Dr. Johnson outlined, that's a sign of efficiency, effectiveness, and professionalism fundamentally. And then a final challenge with this is political interference. Um, traditionally, obviously, the security sector and abuse of the security sector has been a tool for political control. And control of budgets, control of resources is obviously critical to maintaining that sort of um, abuse of control of security sectors poor budget management, the lack of a written security policy and strategy as a tool for financial management helps further that kind of political disruption, that type of corruption um, in every part of the security sector. And the idea that for some reason, the security sector and in particular the military should not be subject to the same rules of financial management, the same standards of financial management that the rest of the public sector is, that, that idea of exceptionalism, sometimes based on secrecy, sometimes based on history or legacy, this is, this is really problematic in terms of, of furthering these, these bad patterns. And we see this also from lessons of history in the sense that um, you know, many countries in Africa, we heard in the, in the introduction, only one African country has submitted its security sector expenditure to the UN this year um, or in the, recent, in the recent process. And yet we know that levels of security sector expenditure across the African continent have been historically extremely high as a proportion of budgets. Where has this gotten us in terms of security for the people, for the nations involved, and in terms of value for money? And this looking at the quality of this resource allocation is something that can help with that. And it's intimately linked to having a national security policy and strategy that's clearly worked out and, inc and inclusive in its it's making. I hope that was five minutes. Well, well thank you very much, uh, Feli. Maybe, uh, Dr. Emil, the, uh, the last question to you, 
listening also to the presentation by Turgulin and Tufeli, um, and given your practical experience in the uh, development of the national security strategy and also documenting many case studies, um, uh, just can you share with the, the participants what is the status of national security strategies in Africa, the presence of such strategies or lack of it? And, and, uh, and, uh, and why do you think, for example, developing an inclusive process of national security strategies Will contrib may contribute to the rational allocation and alignment of security resources. Maybe in seven minutes that would be fine, uh, Emil. But I know we want to give you more time. Please, you are welcome, Dr. Uh, Emil. Okay. Uh, donc, je vais parler en, en français. Uh, merci, le Dr. I'm going to speak in French, Dr. Luca. Thank you. And Dr. Willen. Uh, thank you for having laid out the groundwork for me to answer this question. First, we talked about the status of uh, national security strategies in Africa and how uh, they relate to uh, national security. So we have to establish how to have a rational allocation of resources. So first, I'm going to quickly uh, try to answer this question. I mean, we always have to uh, present a lot of ideas, but we really need to get to the core of the subject. Okay. So first off, there was a book uh, uh, presented by Dr. Joel uh, speaking on security institutions in Africa, and it's one of your recommended reading. We highly recommend it. Uh, in terms of the uh, centrality of the uh, national security strategies, they spoke of the evolution of the security landscape in Africa. As we know, uh, this uh, landscape is full of conflicts and has very complex forms. The threats have many forms. There's uh, maritime piracy, there's extremist violence, there's all sorts of illicit trafficking. And of course, this has been aggravated by the climate change, demographic changes, migration, and this affects the budget of the security sector, of course. Um, on the ground, what is really taking place? Uh, the Africa Center uh, was seeking to uh, do a study. We did a study in 2018 on 10 countries in Africa, including Burkina Faso, Madagascar, Ivory Coast, uh, Senegal, uh, South Africa, and others. And these uh, case studies are also uh, part of the documentation that you have been supplied, provided. These studies reveal that many countries do not have a written a national security uh, strategy written. Many of the countries have a very limited um, written documents on this. They have defense policies in place, but uh, not a, but these are documents that deal with the internal threats and external threats. But now today we are facing transnational threats. And these documents uh, have a certain incoherence between the, the sectorial strategies and the overall national strategy. So this uh, brings to the forefront a fundamental problem. So first of all, there is not a global security vision in many countries since their independence. There is a lack of uh, cohesion and coherence in uh, this arena. There are not security approaches that, that approaches that coming from the state that are uh, centered on the populations. They're more centered on the states. And then within uh, the defense strategies, they really do not speak often of human security. 
and of course the the security of the populations and the populations have not been participants in the elaboration of these strategies and this is why today we are seeing uh, and this is why today we are working on the development of national security strategies and to try to uh, put an end to all of these contradictions and have a cohesive national security strategy and countries today like Niger, Burkina have just uh, published their national strategies. Many countries have decided to, uh, to, to also undertake this approach to have a more holistic strategy to respond to their security challenges. So for the first point, very quickly, that is uh, my answer. And secondly, Second point, how can we ensure that national security strategy is developed um, that, uh, in a transparent fashion, inclusive fashion? Um, and I will take a moment to discuss this because as Dr. Guillen said, uh, on the, Dr. Williams said in terms of budgetization, we want to make a comparison with what's going on in different countries. As Dr. Williams said so well, the uh, security uh, sector gets the lion's share of the national budget. Many studies show that the security sector um, is, is, has certain uh, urgencies. And today, we have at the Dakar forum during yesterday, during the forum, the president of Niger, Bazumba Mohammed, um, they, they spoke on this question. Niger says that they have undertaken many efforts, as said Dr. Willem, be the they had the military uh, represented 24% of the national budget at one time. And today, yesterday, the President Bazou said during the plenary that now the, now the military and security budget is 17%. So this underlies what Dr. Willem mentioned. But President Bazou and President Macky Sall, they advocated uh, the ratio of to to indicate that the um that these expenses should not go beyond a certain percentage and the crises the security crises uh, that the countries are um, in the middle of need to be well managed in terms of the expenditures of public funds there I am happy to say that yesterday the President Macky Sall showed that uh, Senegal is, is, is still an exception. It's the only country in West Africa that um, where the budget for education and health is higher than the defense budget. 25% of its budget is for education. And I believe that that is extraordinary. Nobody does better than that in Africa. But in spite of this, the budgets of defense and security within these budgets, there are many difficulties and challenges. And we must come back upon this. And just as Dr. Willems said, uh, the principles of, of good budgeting administrative, uh, the defense and security in many African countries, uh, oftentimes they, they act above the law. And I believe Dr. Willem talked about the discipline that is necessary throughout the processes, the uh, Ministry of Finance, uh, Ministry of Defense, of Security, it must be said that the uh, security forces in Africa often um, play an important role within the uh, Department of Finances. And then of course there is the president who is the chief of all the armed, the head of all the armed forces. 
and and the all of the institutions must be involved and the ministry of finance and it's also important to see the strength or weakness of the monitoring, the oversight of these expenditures and the mentality that is in place uh, within the domains of security uh, and that, that all of these must be remain confidential and in, in the secrecy uh, classified. And that is an issue also. And so to, Today, I think what we are seeing today in Africa, in West Africa, in French, in Francophone Africa, that we really, um, the, the security forces have a, a very large role in this national security strategy, but we are currently adopting planification and, and better budget allocations. It's a very good thing. It's being better planned, but if this is, undertaken without a vision, without a, a, an objective, this can, uh, the, the, this can lead to um, corruption if it's not well uh, monitored. And, and to the, in Mali, for example, almost two, billion of US dollars uh, were uh, allocated for uh, military and security use and in other countries as well. These are rather important sums of money and there must be mechanisms in place to, for oversight of how these funds are being used. And this is how, uh, as Dr. Fairley also said, we need a national security strategy in place, which will allow us to uh, put a plan in place for uh, proper budgeting to uh, reach our objectives. And to conclude, I would say that in the context of uh, the allocation of resources in the sector of uh, security and national security strategy is essential. It's critical to um, improve the um, the proper allocation and the proper usage of funds deployed. With a national security strategy, the resources that are allocated uh, can better be used to fight the threats that face the country. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, uh, um, uh, Emil. Uh, sorry for a very short period of time, but I just want to the participate what Emil said. We have these case studies, and in fact, you can look at the case study of Burkina Faso as well, and um, other many case studies as he referred to. I just want to highlight one point also is that also fairly indicated. In fact, the African Union committed itself uh, as its member state uh, to develop national security strategy that is inclusive and participated with the, with the engagement of the citizen. Now we have come, really thank you very much, uh, Dr. Willeen and um, Fairley and uh, Emil for such an excellent uh, um, uh, 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 conversation. And I think I believe for the first time you might have come out with some ideas about the link between national security strategy and the budgeting process and some of the core principle as Dr. Willeen shared with you.